So hello, everyone. Uh, today's seminar speaker is uh, Jose Perea, and he will be talking to us about vector bundles for data analysis and dimensionality reduction. Uh, very warm welcome, Jose. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Bastian. Um, so good morning, everybody, or, or good afternoon, or, or good evening, depending on, on where you are. Um, so today, I want to tell you about sort of a growing uh, body of research um, sort of tackling problems we've been thinking about over the last couple of years. Uh, this is work with uh, Luis mm -hmm. Scocola, um, and uh, you can find the details in the in those two papers that are on the archive. Uh, the first one came out um, about sort of a year ago, that we hope it'll be published soon. And then the second one came on the archive this morning. So uh, you are the, the first ones to, to hear about this uh, material. Uh, so just to uh, sort of motivate uh, why we care about vector bundles in data, I wanted to start with, with an example. Uh, so uh, the double Geier is a dynamical system uh, whose uh, equations are given on the lower left. Okay, so uh, uppercase A, uh, epsilon and omega are uh, constants and, uh, and the evolution of the system uh, as, a, as, a, as a function of, of time and you know, spatial positions X and Y is sort of governed by these equations. Um, also in the in the vector field, uh, as you can see, governing the dynamics, uh, what you're seeing is sort of two vortices that are swaying from from left to right, uh, and that that's the that's the dynamics. Um, we also have sort of two sort of particles, uh, a red particle and a, and a blue particle, uh, trapped in the in the dynamics, and and as they move, uh, they describe uh, two attractors for the system. So those are the pictures you're seeing on the right hand side. So one is the, the attractor for, for the uh, red particle and the other one is the attractor for the, for the blue particle. Um, and the typical question you, you ask in dynamical systems is, you know, if I have two attractors, do they have the same topology? Okay. So if you were to, to answer that question, what would you do as a computational uh, scientist? Uh, so the first thing you would probably do is maybe do PCA, maybe some visualization. Uh, that's how we got these pictures. Um, the second thing you do is perhaps compute something about it. Um, you can, you can uh, check that these guys are locally two-dimensional. So there's an estimate of dimension one can do, so locally two-dimensional. Um, and here's the persistence diagrams for both attractors. Um, and I want to draw your attention to the sort of upper left quadrant, uh, sort of blocked by, by that uh, dotted line. Uh, and the reason why I want you to focus on that region is because that's where the topology is contained, right? So the things that are born early in the filtration, uh, the things outside that box are essentially the geometry, how the attractor is embedded in its uh, ambient space. Um, so uh, what you get out of this picture is that both attractors have a sort of very strong generator in dimension one, uh, no generators in dimension zero, uh, sorry, no, no generator in dimension two. So, so persistence wasn't very useful in, in sort of uh, sort of telling apart the topology of these two attractors. So again, is there something else we can compute? Um, so here is uh, one such thing. So, so local PCA, and again, this is how you can estimate the, the local dimension of data. It's something useful you can do. So, so how, how does it work? So suppose that you have a, a data set X inside Rn, and then uh, for every data point, you can think of the collection of its k nearest neighbors. Okay, so for uh, X, the uh, collection of K's nearest neighbors will be the points within the green neighborhood, and for Y would be the points within the uh, pink neighborhood. And what you could do is just run principal component analysis on each region independently. And then the idea is that by doing sort of local PCA, you can one, get a, an estimate of local dimension, uh, but two, you can get an, an sort of an approximation of what the tangent space at x ought to be. Okay, so if you're thinking of x as sample from some manifold, then this process should approximate the tangent space. Um, and, and should, uh, you know, it's not the same as does. So, so, so what you want to do is you want to formalize this process to actually get sort of a mathematical handle on this, in the, in this intuition. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about uh, vector bundles in the, in, the, in the theoretical sense. And we'll go back to, to the data questions in a, in a moment. Um, so uh, what is a, a vector bundle? Um, again, the experts are going to be bored, but I, I thought it was 
sort of morally correct to just to just say what what these objects were. Uh, so so a vector bundle is uh, comprised of uh, three objects. Uh, one is the total space E, uh, the other one is the base space B, and then you have a projection P, so a surjective continuous function. Um, and you want some things to happen. Uh, so the first one is that if you fix a little b in the base space and you take its inverse image uh, through p, then the piece of E you get uh, should be an n-dimensional inner product space, right? So a vector space of dimension n that has an inner product. Um, the second thing you, you want is that uh, for every b that you fix in the, in the base, uh, there should be some open neighborhood u so that when you take its inverse image uh, through p, it turns out to be homeomorphic uh, to u cross rn, okay? And uh, you can pick the homeomorphism uh, in, in such a way that um, it sort of preserves the, the fibers. Uh, that's some mathematical statement. Uh, and then that you get sort of an isomorphism uh, when, you, when you restrict to each fiber, a linear isomorphism. Um, so that's a, that's a vector bundle, you know, just in, in general. But let me give you some examples to, to ground the, the discussion. Um, so perhaps the, the simplest example uh, you can think of is the, is the trivial <laughs> bundle, right? So uh, what it is, is you take uh, your base space B and you just take the Cartesian product with Rn. And the projection is just, you know, recovering the first coordinate. So in this example, you're just putting Rn trivially over every little b. Okay, very simple example. Um, the second example is perhaps more interesting. It is the Mobius band. Um, so uh, I, one way to think about it is uh, as follows. So uh, let E be the collection of pairs uh, Z comma W, where Z is in the unit circle and W is a complex number. So that uh, W is in the line spanned by square root of Z. And here you just have to pick a, a sort of a, a principal branch of log to take square roots. Um, so the idea is that as you're going around the equatorial circle of the Mobius band, you have a line that is twisting as you go around. And then when you come back, it's in the opposite uh, orientation, right? And the projection is just give me the first coordinate. Uh, so the Mobius band is perhaps the first non-trivial example of a, of a, of a, of a vector bond. Um, uh, here's yet another example. Uh, suppose that you have a, a Riemannian manifold B and you fix a, a point X in it, a little X. Um, and you can define the tangent bundle as follows. Um, so consider sort of all the curves on the manifold that pass through X and then take the derivatives of those curves at X. So that gives you a collection of vectors and that's the tangent space at, at X. And, and the tangent bundle is just the collection of all those tangent spaces as you move your, your little x. Okay, cool. Um, and then finally, you have the, the normal bundle. So suppose that you have uh, two Riemannian manifolds, B and M, and that B is uh, smoothly immersed in, in M. Uh, so by that, I mean that uh, the derivative of iota is injective everywhere. Um, so you can define the, the normal uh, bundle as follows. Um, uh, so it's going to be denoted as TB perp, um, and it's going to be the pairs of uh, points x, comma v, where x is a point in B, uh, v is a point in the tangent space of M at a yoda of x, and you want uh, v to be orthogonal to the sort of tangent space at, at, at B. Uh, and then here's what we're using that uh, a yoda is, a, is an immersion. Right, is sort of the, 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 the dimension uh, is, is sort of full rank. Um, we're gonna use this uh, normal bundle later on. So if this definition seems unclear or, or, or suspicious, uh, please uh, speak now. If not, um, let me give you um, another construction that is gonna be super, super useful in a moment. Uh, and it's the following. Um, so we defined, or at least I gave you, we defined what a vector bundle was, and I give you a few examples of vector bundles. Um, now I'm gonna give you a construction. So how do you build vector bundles from, from data? And, and data has a, a sort of a, a, a nice ring to it. Um, so imagine that you have a topological space B and you have a covering of open sets uh, UJ. 
Um, so the data we're going to use to build uh, vector bundles is uh, what is called a cycle. So what it is, is a collection of continuous functions, omega ij, from each uh, non-empty intersection ui uj to the orthogonal group of n by n matrices. And they satisfy uh, the following equation, that uj times omega ij times omega jk is equal to omega ik uh, on, on non-empty triple intersections. So this is what is called the co-cycle condition. And again, it's going to be super, super uh, important in a moment. Um, so here's the example. Um, take B to be the circle and cover it with three open sets, U0, U1, and U2. And let me take the following uh, family of omegas. Uh, we're going to map to O1, the orthogonal group in dimension one. So it's just plus or minus one. And uh, the way omega is going to be defined is just as a constant function. Uh, so omega uh, zero, zero is going to be constant and equal to one. Omega zero, one is going to be constant and equal to minus one, and so on for the, for the rest. OK? So here's how you build a vector bundle with this type of data. So the first thing you do is you take your open sets and you cross them with uh, your, your vector space. So in this case, we're taking R because we're, mapping, we're, we're looking at O1, right? So R1. So, so you take each open set and you cross it with R. Then you take your, your omegas, your omega ij's. And what they are is the data to glue together these disparate pieces that, that, that you build first. And the recipe is in the lower left. Uh, so the recipe says, uh, take a little b from i, and the way you're going to glue uh, the vector v is by gluing it to the product of omega ji and the v on the other uh, sort of corresponding uh, vector space. So if you look at the figure, what this is saying is that um, omega 1, 2 is gluing things sort of trivially, because omega 1, 2 is equal to 1. Uh, omega 0, 1 is minus 1. So it's saying that I'm gluing things backwards. So to do that, you have to do some mental gymnastics and sort of you know, reverse arrows in the, in the appropriate places. And then when you glue everything together, you recover the Mobius bit. So uh, this is sort of the, no, the first non-trivial example of a vector bundle I gave you. And now I have shown you how to build it from finite data, from these omega ij's, OK? So um, just to uh, sort of summarize what we have thus far, uh, we have that if you start with a family of co-cycles with values on the, in the orthogonal group, then you can build uh, vector bundles using the, the previous recipe. Okay. And the nice theorem you can prove is that if you're willing to refine your cover, sort of make your open sets smaller and smaller and smaller, and you are uh, willing to uh, mod out by uh, fiber-wise changes of coordinates, this actually recovers all possible vector bundles over B up to isomorphism. Okay. So um, this is sort of a, a pivotal point in the talk, right? So it's saying I can use cohomology, you know, check cohomology on the left, uh, and that gives you all possible vector bundles. So the left hand side has a very computational uh, feel to it that we're going to exploit in a moment. Okay, now let's let's talk about data. Um, can I ask a question? I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Um, before you go on to the next section, uh, a lot of this material sounds uh, reminiscent to me to the idea of shifts, perhaps mm -hmm. shifts of, of vector spaces over some space. Uh, is that is that like completely out of place here, or or perhaps could you? No, know, no, no, like... no. You're no, you're completely correct. So uh, something I should say here is that I'm actually taking sort of Checo homology with coefficients in a sheaf of uh, sort of on valued continuous functions. So right. I'm using the Checo homology uh, as a way to uh, classify my vector bundles. So you are you are actually on track. So so this is the 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 Checo homology of a sheaf. The Checo homology of your base space with coefficients in a sheaf. Oh. And the and, and the sheaf is sheaf of continuous functions with values in the orthogonal group. Okay. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Oh, great. I didn't want to say those words so that I, did, I didn't scare people, but you know here we are. Um, okay. Okay, so, so now I, I want to move to the to the world of discrete data. And this is the first of the of the two papers I, I sort of advertised. 
Um, and the paper is titled Approximating Discrete Vector Bundles. Um, so what is the, the, the premise? The idea is, um, okay, we have cohomology, we have co-cycles, can we weaken those definitions to make them tolerant to noise and imperfections in data so that we can still talk about vector bundles in the, in the data world? So that's the premise. Um, so it's a simplicial complex K, okay? K is a simplicial complex. Uh, and we're gonna define its discrete epsilon approximate cocycles as the following collection. So um, this looks uh, sort of uh, scary, but, but it isn't. So essentially uh, what you're looking at is for every edge of K, you're gonna give me one of these matrices omega ij, okay? So again, in the edge ij, just fix a matrix omega ij. And we're gonna do it in such a way that omega ij should be the same as the transpose or the inverse of omega ji. So if you flip the orientation of the vertices, you invert the matrix. And we're also going to require that they satisfy this inequality on triangles. That if you go from ij to jk, uh, that is sort of at most epsilon away from uh, omega ik. So again, if you, if, you're, if, you, if you remember cohomology, in cohomology, these two guys should be equal on the nose. That is the co-cycle condition. But we're weakening it to allow for, for, for inequalities, right? So that the co-cycle condition is not satisfied exactly, but perhaps up to some error epsilon, okay? So that's what we call epsilon approximate co-cycles, okay? Step two. Um, we're going to define the epsilon approximate cohomology as some quotient of the co-cycles. Um, and what is that quotient is, is, again, very, very similar to what you do with co-boundaries. So you say that two things are equivalent if they differ by sort of a co-boundary, essentially. Okay. Um, the, the good thing now is that this epsilon approximate cohomology, which is just a set, it's not a group as we had before, it's just a set. Uh, this, in, this inherits uh, a metric from the Frobenius norm in the orthogonal group. So we can talk about distances in this epsilon approximate cohomology. Okay, so with that scary preamble, uh, now we're ready for the first sort of big theorem we're able to prove. So we prove that if epsilon is less than one half, so meaning that you, your, co your co-cycle condition is satisfied up to a one half error, then the classical map from cohomology to vector bundles can be extended now to this setup of just approximate cycles, right? So we're able to, to sort of uh, allow for cocycle conditions that, satisf that are satisfied only up to an epsilon error, but we're still able to associate sort of a vector bundle to, 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 to that, to, to those cycles, to those approximate cocycles. Okay. Jose? Yeah. I have a question here. So do you, do you happen to know any calculations of, say, the vitorius rips complex of ON with epsilon made for positive? No, no, no. no. So um, I'm curious if this is reflecting some phase shift in the, the homotopy type as you as increase of ON. I see. No, the, 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 the epsilon actually comes from, from, a, from a slightly different place, which is, and I didn't talk about this, but the idea that vector bundles can also be classified by maps to Grassmannians. Okay, so there's sort of three different equivalent definitions via co-cycles, mm -hmm. uh, via, via maps to a classifying space to a Grassmannian, right. and uh -huh. the definition I gave at the beginning. In right. the approximate sense, we do not get maps to a Grassmannian on the nose, but mm -hmm. we get maps to a neighborhood of a Grassmannian. And then the epsilon is controlling sort of uh, how big you can take that neighborhood so that it's still deformation retracts onto the Grassmannian. Right, okay, great. So, yeah, that's where the epsilon comes from. Super, all right, thanks. Great. Um, so that's the, that's the first part of the theorem. We're able to associate vector bundles to, to these approximate cycles. And then the, the second sort of big theorem there is that we can actually, that we actually have algorithms uh, to compute the, the, the Stiefel-Whitney classes at least the first list for Whitney classes of the of the of the sort of appropriate vector bundles we are we're computing. 
Um, so if you don't know about characteristic classes, uh, what they are is they are cohomology classes that measure how complicated your vector bundle is. So for example, the first default Whitney class measures if the vector bundle is uh, orientable. So in particular, the vector bundle is orientable if and only if the first default Whitney class is zero, right? So now it's a very strong obstruction to orientability. Uh, the second default Whitney class is a measure of what is called a spin structure. Uh, that and, and it's cool. Um, and, but, the, but the main point is that these, these two uh, sort of uh, maps are, are sort of stable in the sense that if two things in the domain are close, then the images in cohomology are the same, right? So we're again, have some, some, some resistance to noise. And, and consistency here means that if epsilon is small enough, in this case, less than uh, two ninths or one ninth, then we compute the stiefel whitney class of the underlying vector bundle of, of, of the real one that is being sort of shifted by the noise. Okay. And, and again, just to show you that these are actually implementable algorithms, let me tell you how W1 is computed. So if you start with a family of matrices, right? So these are the ones that have the approximate co-cycle condition. So the way you get the first stiefel whitney class is by taking determinants. So just take the determinants of all of those matrices, and that gives you the first default Whitney class. Right? So it's, it's something very, very computable. I, again, if, if you believe that determinants are, are computable. Um, so how do we compute the, the second uh, stiefel Whitney class? Um, that one is a little bit more involved. So let me let me not dwell on it, but just say that it is also computable, and and, and it somehow reduces to computing QR decompositions, which again is something uh, computable. Um, so let me go back to the original example of these two attractors from the, uh, uh, from the dynamical system. Um, so we computed the, uh, the persistence diagrams and, and it wasn't super illuminating in terms of the topology. Uh, so here's what we're gonna do. Step one, we're gonna apply local 2D PCA to get sort of local sort of charts on each one of these attractors. And we're gonna compute these omega JKs, which are gonna somehow sort of translate the PCA basis at XJ to a nearby PCA basis for XK. Okay, so think of omega JKs as sort of the transition functions for the tangent uh, bundle estimated via local PCA. The next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take the largest delta so that the omegas are still sort of approximate cycles of the right sort of uh, error rate. Um, from that, we can compute the stiefel whitney classes as we did before. And the final step is going to be to decompose the computed stiefel whitney classes with respect to the persistent cohomology bases that have been computed, just to see how sort of how robust these classes are to the underlying geometry. And here's what we get. Um, the gray region is sort of the places where we can have sort of bases contributing to W1. Sort of outside of the green region of the gray region, no dots can contribute to the to the stiefel Whitney class. And what you're seeing, at least here on the right, is that we're, I'm highlighting some classes. So these are the ones that contribute to writing W1. Uh, so in particular, W1 is very persistent for the second attractor and it's not persistent in the first attractor in particular is zero, okay? So because the stiefel Whitney classes are different, uh, these two attractors cannot have the same topology. In particular, one is a cylinder, the one on the left, and the second one is a Mobius band, which is sort of hard to see, okay? So this is the type of, 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 of question that is motivating the study of, of, uh, of, sort of vector bundles for, for, for data, and in particular, being able to com compute things like characteristic classes for them. Okay. Any questions thus far? Okay. Um, let me give you one uh, more example. And this is from, uh, from computational chemistry, sort of the problem of cryogenic electron microscopy. So the idea is that you have sort of some molecule and you're taking a bunch of 
sort of photos of it from random directions. Uh, the photos are noisy. And what you want to do is you want to reconstruct the molecule from the, from the noisy uh, photos, OK? Um, so the first problem is noise. So what you want to do is you want sort of to denoise the images, OK? Uh, the, the, you want to denoise the two-dimensional photos. So how do you do that? Uh, the idea is take photos that are taken from sort of similar viewing angles and average them, and average them to, 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 to sort of rule out, to rule out the noise. Um, but you have to know which photos were taken from nearby viewing angles, which is not available because the photos were taken from random unknown positions because the, the molecule is just moving in space without uh, control. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Um, for each pair of images, what you could do is you can find the, base, the best uh, rotational alignment. So you put one on top of the other via an SO2 rotation. OK. Um, next, uh, define the sort of this procrustes distance between images by saying, I'm going to align I as best as possible I can to J, and I'm going to measure the distance between the aligned images. And what we expect is that aligning I with J and then aligning J with K should be similar to aligning I with K if, if the distances between XI, XJ, and XK is, is small. Okay. So uh, now you know that this type of approximate co-cycle is exactly the same thing as a vector bundle. And it turns out that uh, that bundle is trivial if and only if all the images can be aligned at the same time. Okay. So again, remember that we want to align images as much as possible so that we can uh, take averages and mod out the noise. Uh, and, and this is saying that you can align all of them if and only if this vector bundle is trivial. So uh, we're going to do something very similar to what we did just now. We're going to uh, compute uh, sort of the approximate co-cycle, uh, which is this omega. And then we're going to compute another characteristic class, in this case, the Euler class. Um, again, if you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. We have uh, algorithms that can compute it for you. And you can look at the paper as well. And, and this is what the Euler class turns out to be for, for that uh, vector bundle. Uh, so it's very persistent, and in particular, non-zero. So this says that you cannot align all the images at the same time. So don't even try to write algorithms for doing that. Uh, so our goal is to, again, in the future, try to use these types of characteristic classes to inform what are the types of, of local collections of, 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 of objects that can be aligned. So there is no global alignment. So you should instead pursue local alignment. And again, we hope that that can be informed by these characteristic classes. So in the last portion of the talk, I want to I want to mention sort of again the most recent work about how do we use again these ideas of dimension of, of fiber bundles or in vector bundles characteristic classes to inform dimensionality reduction algorithms. So again, this came out uh, this morning on the archive. Um, and, and here's the, the, the sort of motivating example. Um, uh, the configuration space of, of Pentane. Uh, so Henry's uh, an expert on, on these types of, 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 of data sets. Um, and here's something you can do. Uh, so Pentane is sort of a chain of five carbons, uh, each of which is sort of bonded to, to two or, or three uh, hydrogens. And then what you can do is uh, mod out by translations and rotations in 3D space. So that's the configuration space or the conformation space rather. Um, one can sample these types of things in Python using RDKit. And in particular, you can get a distance matrix for, for this uh, configuration space. Um, here's the persistence diagram for, for that data set. So you get a very persistent class in dimension one. So that is very, uh, sort of very, very telling. Um, here are two dimensionality reduction algorithms applied to this data set. Uh, so first you have isomap. And on the lower right, you have TSNI, which is, again, a, a very uh, popular machine learning dimensionality reduction algorithm. Um, and, do, and they do a terrible job in, in, in sort of reconstructing the topology of the, of, of the configuration space. Right? The barcodes or the persistence diagrams are completely different from those of the data set. So here's what we're able to reconstruct. Uh, and the method we are introducing is called fibered. 
Um, so it recovers the uh, the confirmation space as a Mobius band, and that's where the uh, where the dot in persistence comes from, from the data set essentially being a Mobius band. And one can go back to the data and check that it's actually a Mobius band. Um, so how does Fibered work? What, what is the idea? So the idea is that if you have a data set that is very complicated topologically, you should first uh, parameterize the topology. Do that first. So uh, we're gonna do that by uh, constructing a map from the data to some Riemannian manifold B. So if you have, a, if your data set is a Mobius band, then you can think of B as a circle and the projection F as just projecting, projecting onto the equatorial circle of the Mobius band. Uh, alternatively, if you know about circular coordinates, you can compute the circular coordinate for the data. Okay, so that already parameterizes sort of the, the large scale topology. Um, the next thing we're going to do is we're going to embed the, the Riemannian manifold B, which again is, is, is parameterizing the large scale topology of the data. We're going to embed it in Euclidean space. So again, if B is, let's say, the circle, uh, we can embed it in, in R3, maybe on the XY plane. Okay, so this is the input to fiber. And the philosophy is that uh, you should let B take care of the large scale topology and the dimensionality reduction should happen in the fibers of F. That's where you wanna do the dimensionality reduction. Okay, so if you have B smoothly embedded in RN or RD, um, then it's got sort of a tangent piece in blue, and it's got a normal piece in purple, the TB perp. And again, the goal of Fibered is to sort of improve the, the, the map iota to an iota bar uh, so that I'm mapping X to RD, but in such a way that the fibers are being mapped to the sort of normal direction to B in RD. Okay, so that's the goal, the philosophical goal. How do we do that? So the first thing we do is we fix uh, an open cover for B and pull it back to X, okay? So that gives you the X case. Step two, do uh, a local dimensionality reduction on the X J's. So for example, you can do maybe PCA or MDS on each X J separately, okay? So now we have our, our little pieces X J inside of RDN, RD, RD plus N. Um, the thing to, to notice is that not all directions are created equal in, in this Euclidean space. Um, the horizontal direction, again, is already accounted by the manifold B, okay? So think of that horizontal direction as already living in the tangent space to B. And what is left is sort of the normal direction, the normal fiber-wise direction. And this is the thing that is being sort of forgotten by F. That is the thing that is being crushed by F, okay? So now we can restate the goal for fiber as sort of embedding sort of injectively these fiber-wise normals into the normal uh, TB, TB perp, okay? So that's the, the evolving goal. Let me, let me put more, more math to this. So if you, if, you, if you did your local fiber-wise dimensionality reduction, you have your LJs, and you can isolate the normal direction that again, is not being parameterized by B, they can, you can just think of, of the resulting orthogonal projection FJ from XJ to RN. Again, that is the, the, the fiber-wise normal component that is being crushed by F. So, now that we are in this local collection of, of, of maps, we've been here before, you know, like when we did local PCA, this, this feels exactly like that. So we can go ahead and, and write down sort of local alignments of those normal pieces. And that gives you an approximate vector bundle that again, looks like the sort of normal direction that is being forgotten by F. And then the final ingredient is that we also have sort of in the, in the purple side, uh, a computation that can be done with local PCA where you map through F and IOTA 
then you have sort of the tangent part to, to B and you have the perp to B. So just keep the perp, the perp part. And again, we've been here before. Uh, there is a local alignment problem that you can write down, which again uh, defines uh, an approximate vector bundle. And now we can sort of upgrade our goal to an actual problem. The problem is going to be to embed the green bundle, sort of the forgotten normal into the purple bundle, which is the, uh, the, the, the directions we are left with uh, given the embedding of B. So this is what Fiverr does. It solves this problem. And the first thing we show in the paper is that the problem has a, if the problem has a solution, it can be computed or approximated by solving this very simple minimization problem. So the SJs, SJKs are, are weights, which are essentially the, the cardinality of, inter, of intersections. The omegas and the thetas can be computed from local alignments. And the fees are the things you want to find. These are elements in the Stiefel manifold of n uh, frames in Rd minus d. Okay. So it turns out that if you if you solve this optimization problem, you can actually write down your iota bar. And that's what Fiverr does. It solves that optimization problem and uses the solution to upgrade your iota to a better dimensional reduction uh, result. Um, but having this problem of bundles actually opens up the, just the theory that you can exploit. And here's something that you can prove, which is, I think, kind of cool. So if the problem has a solution, meaning that if you can embed the green, the green bundle into the purple bundle, and if you pick the dimensions to be sort of complementary, meaning that the dimension of RD is the dimension of the manifold B by plus the dimension of the normal forgotten, then the first default Whitney classes of the, of the green bundle have to be, the first Whitney class of the bundle has to be equal for the green and the purple bundles. And again, this is something we can compute and use as obstructions. And then the second cool thing is that if you, if you bump up the dimension in the target space by one, then now you have this formula with uh, second Stiefel Whitney classes and cap products. And again, this is something we can compute and use as obstructions to choose dimensions and seeing whether or not the, 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 the embedding problem has a solution. Okay. So this is how topologies operate, right? You know, when you try to prove does this manifold embed in this Euclidean space, these are the types of calculations you do. You compute characteristic classes and you figure out if the equations work out. And if they don't, you know that the space cannot be embedded. So that's exactly how we proceeded here. We, 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 we computed sort of fibered on the, on the space of, of, of computation space of painting using the circular coordinate. Um, and, and the cool thing is that now we can, now that we have an actual parameterization, we can study things like the energy landscape. So on the bottom of the page, you're seeing uh, sort, of, sort of each dot is one of these configurations, each one of these molecules, and the color is now the, the energy of that configuration, okay? And then just by doing a Gaussian smoothing, uh, we get the picture on the lower right. So we have estimated from data what the energy landscape looks like for this molecule. So if you're thinking of doing sort of molecular dynamics, you can do it here. You don't have to do it in the ambient space from the molecule, from which the molecules uh, come from. Um, and then the final example I'll, I'll describe is uh, from the double Geyer attractor again. Uh, we have another, another attractor. It's not uh, a cylinder, it's not a Mobius band. Uh, here's the persistence diagram on the left for the attractor in question. It's got two classes in dimension one and one class in dimension two. So you suspect it's a torus. Um, and when you do TSNI, then the persistence diagrams are completely destroyed, right? Like you lose your two, your, your two classes in dimension one, and then your class in dimension two gets now doubled. And the reason is because TSNI pinches the, 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 the sort of red regions. It sort of it crushes the red regions and, and it creates sort of artificial uh, classes in dimension two. Uh, this is what fiber does. Uh, it recovers the, the torus exactly, and you can even sort of put arrows to, to recover the dynamics. Uh, we can talk more about it if you're interested, but uh, the point is that um, we've been able to uh, sort of develop this theory of, of sort of vector bundles for data, 
where the idea is sort of take things like the co-cycle condition, which we know uh, sort of describe vector bundles in theory, and weaken them to take into account noise so that you only have approximate co-cycle conditions. Uh, we showed that you can use those, uh, those ideas to study attractors, you know, distinguish uh, cylinders from Mobius bands in, in the double gyre, and to tell you that it is not possible to align all of those images in the cryo-EM application. And then we moved into the idea of, of using the sort of the, the machinery for dimensionality reduction, where the idea is let the topology account, sort of let F account for the global topology and now do dimensionality reduction on the fibers. And again, that reduces to an embedding problem in terms of vector bundles. Uh, I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jose, for a very cool talk. I really enjoyed it. Let's all uh, briefly unmute and, and give a round of applause. All right, so we have time for some public questions. Uh, please unmute or let me let me read this out. I'm gonna gonna wait briefly. So we have we have um, a question in the chat. So concerning yes. the previous page, I'm gonna go to the previous page, which I'm guessing is sort of two back. So maybe maybe this, uh, perhaps one more. Um, uh, the previous page. Are you embedding your space manifold in RD or RD plus N space? Um, so David, uh, the first local reduction, sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm reducing the XJs to RD plus N. And then what I want to do is assemble the verticals of, of those reductions, sort of the RN direction along sort of the purple direction. So this happens in RD. R, R, D, R, R, big D. So in the end, you want to map your data X to uh, R, D uh, in such a way that uh, you're, you're doing it sort of along the, the B that you already have embedded. Uh, does that make sense, uh, David? Uh, maybe. I think we'll probably see see some more questions if if David is not not satisfied with the answer. Oh, okay. Do we have <laughs> any? Sure, good. Do we have any other questions at at this point? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I have a question also about this slide. So, how do you choose B here, or B, is it B, something yeah. you need to? Yeah. Yeah. So you typically do it by sort of investigating the topology of the data, right? So compute persistence diagrams for X, and then. That should uh, that should sort of guide you to choosing your B. Um, you know, if you have a, like a circular, like a big circle uh, component in H1, then choose B to be the circle. You can F to be like the circular coordinate. Um, the other thing is that you can use uh, just any manifold learning algorithm as your F, right? So so start there. Just use you know uh, Laplacian uh, sort of eigenmaps or sort of whatever that gives you an initial guess. But again, the goal is for, for this first vertical arrow to capture the global scale topology of the data. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Yep. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi. First of all, super, very cool talk. Loved it. I Thank had you. two questions, just curious about like future directions that could be possible. Um, when you use the Riemannian structure, I was like going to ask about uh, general, now I want to throw connections, maybe connections with curvature on these bundles, but I was, mm -hmm. maybe maybe that's sort of implicitly happening because you use this in Riemann, Riemannian structure with the tangent bundles. That was like yeah. one direction. And then the other direction was you're sort of allowing the co-cycle condition to not precisely be a co-cycle feels very like higher co-cycle derby to me. So I was wondering yeah, yeah. if you like, future directions to push these any further? Yeah, it's, it's funny that you, that you say that, uh, Cheney. Um, the, the, the Derby idea was actually the first one that was suggested by, by Niels Vaz. Um, uh, and sort of, uh, sort of thinking about these like in two, like in two categories and so on. But uh, we, we haven't been able to make the connection yet. So if you have ideas on, on how to connect the two, you know, I'll be, I'll be really happy to talk. Um, in terms of, of, of the idea of, of connection, um, 
I guess the, the thing I'll be curious about is, you know, can, can you leverage that to compute, for example, higher characteristic classes? Um, that, that, I guess that's what, where my curiosity lies. But yeah, both, I think, are very interesting directions to, to think further. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yeah. So Nestor is asking in the chat, can we choose another lead group instead of the orthogonal group so that the claims still hold? In other words, why do you choose this group in particular? Uh, Nestor, great question. Um, in my mind, there's no, there's nothing like terribly specific about the orthogonal group in theory, but in practice there is. So that if you look at the algorithms, um, you know, there's a lot of optimization theory done in matrix groups. And, and that's why these type of, of, sort of, of groups come up. Um, so if you have sort of good algorithms to do alignment, because you have to compute these omegas and those, the, the omegas and the fees, and, and those turn out to be the results of optimization problems in orthogonal groups. So, so if you have similar machinery in other Lie groups, you know, the theory goes through, but then the practice, the algorithmic practice, it's I think a little bit more difficult. Very nice. I think we have one other question that uh, that might get uh, might have been scrolled over, and that is from coming from Dave Damiano. It's about how sensitive is this program to the density of the data. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, right? Like, the, I mean, the answer is the answer should be very right, but but I don't know exactly where it breaks. Um, yeah, again, this is very new stuff, and and we're only starting to see you know, in the realm of uniform density, what are the things we can do? But again, it would be interesting to see things like robustness and, and, and how the distribution of the data plays a role into the guarantees of recovery we have. Uh, so yeah, a great question, but but no answers just now. Jose, I had a question on one of your um, last slides with the molecular dynamics. Yeah, yeah. Here. So, Am I correct, first of all, that the colors are different between the top and the bottom? On the top yes, left, yes. the coloring is yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, in, the, in the top, the, the color is the vertical direction. Right. And in the bottom is energy. And then in the bottom, um, you know, you see points that are nearby, but have slightly different colors. And that's just because it's coming from an MDS simulation. Is, is that right? So, correct, right. The way you sample the, 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 the space of configurations is sort of non-uniform. And, and again, remember that this is the result of taking that non-uniform sample and then doing dimensionality reduction on it. So, so, so the non-uniform density sort of travels. I see, thanks. Yeah. But you can still see the sort of symmetry of the energy landscape, which is, which is cool in the end. So the lower, the picture on the lower right. Mm -hmm. All right, any more questions? Hi. Uh, Hi. Yeah, it's wonderful stuff, Jose. That's amazing. Really cool to see it's presented. I have two questions. So one is, um, I mean, would you in future think that developing K-theory for these sorts of ideas be reasonable or computable? And uh, so maybe just, obviously this is like a wide open question. So maybe just your feeling for this in general. Yeah, I, I mean, I've gotten that question many, many times, and and the answer is yeah, so, someone should do it, right? Like, like we are we're already computing sort of uh, sort of isomorphism classes of vector bundles from uh, sort of uh, imperfect data, so one should just take the program all the way. Uh, we just haven't done it, but by all the way, I mean you know, like like again, just take the machinery from K theory and see what you can prove in the in the in the approximate sense. Yeah, that would be amazing. And the second question is, I guess, um, so sometimes in geometry, one comes across things that are not necessarily simplicial complexes because they're mm -hmm. just metric spaces with like, um, say a metric measure structure. So you have like a nice measure and a metric structure, but not necessarily yeah. a simplicial complex structure. Correct. So so kind of my question is how much of this do you really need? I mean, for all of this to work for K to be a simplicial complex because Sometimes it could be interesting to deal with other things. Just in, so yeah, I saw that you had the K zero there, and you had like the probably the, like a net of points that you yeah, so, stuff with. Yeah, so I'm thinking. Yeah, so perhaps you, you you're referring to uh, to the approximate to perhaps these slides. Right, 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 um, right. Um, 
so the so not really right so um, th th i mean the way this feels is like like if you think of the simplicial complex k and you cover it with the with the open stars of its vertices right so what this is doing is essentially assigning sort of a a a, a, a sort of a system of transition fun of functions of clutching functions to that covering so you, you, I think you only need some sort of finiteness condition, sort of finitely many open sets to, to try to define this, um, some sort of discreteness uh, to, to define this. Um, so as long as you have like an atlas, like some yeah, yeah, yeah. charts and an atlas and transition functions. You yeah, because yeah, that's what this right? is, right? So it's assigning mm -hmm. to every vertex, sort of to every edge, it's assigning sort of a, a transition function, right? And that, and that edge feels like the intersection of the, of the open stars of the vertices, um, and again, the, when 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 we when we have this theorem in the end that you know we are able to to extend the classical map from exact cocycles to approximate cocycles, um, I should also point out that if you allow for sub for barycentric subdivisions of K, so if you allow to subdivide K and take sort of finer and finer cocycles, um, then you recover all vector bundles over the geometric realization. Oh, that's right. It's, it's, it's sort of the same idea as in Czech cohomology, right? Like if you allow your cover to be refined, then then you can get more and more vector bundles. So okay. that, that's 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 yeah, it's, it's got the same feeling here. Yeah, no, that's that's great. That's uh, I'm gonna have to read the paper. Obviously, I haven't because it just came out today. So, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so maybe point. along those lines, like maybe just could you try to walk me through if I wanted to use this to show that something is orientable. Mm -hmm. um, or that I could give it an orientation. How would yep. that work in practice? Just uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, if you so essentially you, you would follow this 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 playbook that I'm outlining here. Um, so if you're if you if you start with that, let's say a point cloud. Um, you know something you could do is you 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 can divide it into overlapping patches, so that each patch can be approximated by a vector space. Okay. So that's why that's what the local PCA is doing. Uh, step one. Step two, try to align those local pieces with something in the orthogonal group. That is called the, the typically the, the orthogonal procrustes problem, where you try to align sort of bases or vector spaces using something from the orthogonal group. And then you follow the, the other two bullet points. Essentially, uh, W1 is going to be the determinants of these omega JKs. Right, so just take the, the determinants of all, of all these omegas, and that is going to give you a cocycle in this simplicial cohomology group on the lower right. If that class is zero, then the bundle was not orient was not orientable. Sorry, so so here now there's a step that you go between like your approximate mm -hmm. check H two group to the, the yeah. just the real that that H one is just a simplicial one, right? On R delta. Yeah, correct. The, the one the last one is just a simplicial one. So the so R delta is the Ribs complex of X. That's just a simplicial complex, and H one is just a simplicial cohomology with coefficients in Z mod two. And again, what that cocycle is, what this omega one is, is to every edge, just associate the determinant of omega J K. Ah. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I got it. Yeah. So then that's that's okay. Yeah, you can do that. That's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and and we do it yeah. right. Like that's the that's the picture on the lower left. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. Hey. Well, thank you very much. It's been great. And thanks for the organization, everyone. Yeah, thank you for the questions. All right, we're approaching the hour mark. So if there's no quick questions anymore, I would stop the recording here potentially, and then we could move to some to some private questions.